It's getting late. Can you please go to sleep now? But Ma, I'm not sleepy. Come on, close your eyes and try counting sheep. I'm sure you'll fall asleep eventually. But Ma... Come on, Matthew. Go to bed. Go to bed. Hmm. Can you at least tuck me in bed and tell me a bedtime story? Alright, alright. Go on. Go to bed. Alright, alright. Now lie down. What kind of story would you want me to tell you? Hmm, how about the one about Grandma and the kite? Okay, now promise me you will fall asleep after this, okay? Promise. Okay now, once upon a time, a girl named Maria Isabella had just turned 16. Each set of her padrinos had given her gifts and a purse filled with coins to spend on anything she wanted. So, she visited the vicinity of the Plaza Imperial to shop. There, she saw a young man dressed in a coat embroidered with stars. She decided she would find out who he was. The first 20 people she asked did not know him. It was a butcher's boy who told her who he was. His name is Lorenzo do Vicencio. I know him because he shops here with his father once every Sunday. My master saved some of the finest cuts for their family. They're rather famous, you know. Maestro of Essential, the father, named Stars. Stars? And would you know why he walks with his eyes closed? The sun, I mean. Well, Lorenzo certainly isn't blind. I think he keeps his eyes closed to preserve his vision for his stargazing at night. He mentioned he had some sort of telescope that he uses. How could I meet him? You. What makes you think he will even see you? Listen, he only has his eyes for the stars. Then I'll make him see me. Take me to the best kite maker. Oh, there's no one left. Good seeing you here again. What brought you here? This is my friend. I brought her because... I need a kite large enough to strap me onto. Then I must fly high enough to be among the stars themselves so that anyone looking at the stars will see me among them. And I must be able to wave at least one hand to that person. What you need is a balloon or someone else to love. A balloon simply would not do. It wouldn't be able to achieve the height that I need. A kite is impossible to make. There are no materials that are immediately available for such an absurd undertaking. In fact, there is no design that can allow a kite to support the weight of a person, and it is simply impossible. Impossible to design, impossible to find the materials. But you're the most talented kite maker here. I'm sure I can figure it out. Please, I beg you. Conceivably, I could dream of such a design. That much I'll grant you. If I concentrate hard enough, I know it will come to me. That much I'll concede. But the materials are another matter. Please, tell me what I need to find. None of it can be bought, and certainly none of it can be found here in Ciudad Mayora. Although, wonder can be found here if you know where to look. Tell me. I think that's all I'd need. As you can see, it is more than any man could hope to accomplish. But I'm not a man. Is any love worth all this effort, looking for the impossible? 
What makes you think I'm in love? I'll get everything. But it may take a lifetime to gather everything. A lifetime is all I have. I cannot go alone. You're younger than me. But I'll sponsor you as my companion. Will you come with me? Of course. After all, this shouldn't take more time than I have to spare. It may take significantly longer than you think. Then please, Sir Antivades, dream the design and I'll have everything you listed when we return. I've already spoken with my parents and both of my patinos. Let's go. I'm ready to go. What did you tell your kinfolks? That I would be back in a month or so. It took almost 40 years for Maria Isabella and the butcher's boy to find all the items on Melkor Antivadis' impossible list. They began at Viriato, where the sanctuary of the first tree stood unmolested by time. They traveled north to the lands of Cabaroquis, where the Pobo Montaja dwelt in seclusion. They sailed eastwards to Palawan, where the traders from countries across the seas converged in a riot of tongues. They ventured westwards to the dark lands of Sikihor and Jomaljig, where the silent ones kept court whenever both sun and moon occupied the same horizon. They visited the fabled cities of the south, the Altandag, the Albin, and the Albajau, where fire-shrouded jinn and the Tikbarang waged an endless war of attrition. They entered the marbled underworld of the sea lords of Romblon and brave the lair of the Marinduque, in whose house the dead surrendered their memories of light and laughter. When they ran out of money, after the sixth year of travel, Maria Isabella and the butcher's boy spent time looking for ways to finance their quest. She began knowing only how to dance, sing, play the violin, and so the butcher's boy began knowing how to cut up a cow. By the time they had completed the list, they had more than quintupled the amount of money they began with, and they both learned how to run a plantation, raise horses big and small, and chicken, cow, and sheep prepare medicine for all sorts of ailments, worries, and anxieties, make ceramics and lenses from almost any quality of sand, and many, many other means of making money. In the 14th year of the quest, a dreadful storm destroyed their growing caravan of found things and they lost almost everything. It was the last time that Maria Isabella allowed herself to cry. The butcher's boy took her hand, and they began all over again. In their 22nd year together, they took stock of what they had, referred to the thousands of items still left unmarked on their list, exchanged a long silent look filled with immeasurable meaning, and went on searching for the components of the impossible kite, solving the riddles of the toothless crone I I seen to find what would be part of a wingtip, climbing Apu Amang, to spend 70 sleepless nights to get the components of the ferrule, and finally spending 18 years painstakingly collecting the 15,000 different strands of thread that would make up Aquiline's surface fabric. When at last they returned to Ciudad Mayora, both stooped and older, they paused briefly at the gates of the Portundu Transgresiones. Do you feel like you've wasted your life? No, nothing is ever wasted. Good day, how can I help you? Is Melkor Antivades here? Oh, I regret to inform you that he passed away many years ago. My name is Rowel Antivades, grandson of Melchor Antivades. Yes, but do you still make kites? Kites? Of course. From time to time, someone wants an aquilon or... Before Melkor Antivades died, 
Did he leave instructions for a very special kind of kite? Well, my grandfather did leave a design for a woman named Maria Isabella Duchello, but... I am she. Listen, young man. I've spent all my life gathering everything Melkor Antivadis said he needed to build my kite. Everything is outside. Build it. And so, Ruel Antivadis unearthed the yellowing parchment that contained the design of the impossible kite that Melkor Antivadis had dreamed into existence and proceeded to build the Aquiline. When it was finished, it looked nothing at all like either Maria Isabella or the butcher's boy had imagined. The kite was huge and looked like a star, but those who saw it could not agree on how best to describe the marvelous conveyance. The butcher's boy stood back and looked at the woman who he had grown old with. As she rose, he sighed and reflected on the absurdity of life, the heaviness of loss, the cruelty of hope, the truth about quests, and the relentless nature of a love that knew only one direction. He realized that all those years they were together, she had never known his name. As she rose above the city of her birth, Maria Isabella, took a moment to gasp at the immensity of a city that sprawled beneath her and recalled how everything had begun. At one exquisite interval during her ascent, Maria Isabella thought she spied the precise tower where Lorenzo du Vicenzo, the stargazer, must live and work. She felt the exuberant joy of her lost youth bubble up within her and mix with the fiery spark of love she had kept alive for sixty years. And in a glorious blaze of irrepressible happiness, she waved her free hand. When a powerful wind took the kite to sudden new heights, Ciudad Meora and everything below her vanished in the dark. And in the city below, in one of the high rooms of the silent Torre do Astronomos, where those who had served with distinction were housed and honored, an old man, long retired and plagued by cataract, sighed in his sleep and dreamed a dream of unnamed stars. <laughs>